Five points, Highland Slam! Oh yeah! Tremendous. That is exactly what we need on a Saturday evening. Thank you so, so much for coming along. This is the Loud Poets Highland Slam. My name is Kevin McLean. Yes, I'm wearing shorts. I did not realize Inverness was going to be tropical. Uh, thank you very much for, for making that. Josie, uh, our, our lovely sacrificial poet, who is up from Bristol, now has a very skewed view of what Inverness looks like. Uh, but we're, we're happy for have to this misconception. It's a good one. Uh, so yes, thank you very much uh, for having us. Uh, give me a little... Whoop, if you have been to a slam before. A few of you, a few of you, mostly the slammers. Good, good, good. Hey, give me a little whoop if you have never been to a slam before. A slightly more terrified whoop. Good, good, good. Uh, well, whether you have been to a million slams before or this is your very first one, we are very grateful that you decided to come along. This, as I said, is the Highlands Heat of the Loud Poet Slam Series 2023. Uh, yeah. <laughs> It's uh, it's very exciting uh, for, for us here at Loud Poets. Uh, if you don't know us, this is our first time kind of coming up to Inverness. I know we know uh, a few people here, but if you've never heard of us, uh, then what are we doing? Um, we are going around uh, doing spoken word, uh, spoken word poetry. Slam poetry is a big part of that. Uh, and we have uh, been lucky enough to get some money from Creative Scotland. Big up Creative Scotland. You can see all the people who did not get money from Creative Scotland being like... No whoop for them. Uh, we were very, very, very lucky, very grateful uh, to that they funded our 2023 season. Uh, and that includes uh, showcases, our, our regular uh, home in Edinburgh at the Scottish Storytelling Centre, a beautiful venue that we have worked with for a very long time. Uh, and then also our slam series. So we have uh, heats all around the country. We have north, east, south, west, central, and Highlands. Uh, for each slam heat, we will get a winner and we will get a runner up, and they will all go on to compete at the Loud Poets Grand Slam final as part of the Edinburgh International Book Festival. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I can tell this is a spoken word audience because you're like, the book festival. Uh, <laughs> We were as surprised as you are. Uh, no, it's 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 really lovely. Uh, the book fest haven't traditionally had a lot of spoken word, but uh, last year we were lucky enough to kind of co-produce with them a spoken word showcase that went down an absolute treat. Turns out people actually like poetry with a bit of fucking energy, uh, which was nice. Uh, and so they they were very uh, happy and kind of on board for partnering for for this. So the winner and the runner up will go and compete at the book fest, and they will do so for three thousand pounds. Which every time I say it still sounds made up, like I'm just picking a random number. They, they will compete for king of the universe. Like it doesn't, if you know anything about poetry or money, it's a fucking lot. Uh, so we are very, very excited to, to be able to do uh, to do that, to do a slam with a big prize uh, that is really representative of the, the kind of whole country. Because I think a lot of it, <laughs> telling you guys, I don't know if you've not noticed, but a lot of art kind of gets pulled centrally into the central belt. Have you guys noticed that at all? <laughs> yeah. um, so it is very nice uh, to be able to make sure that the kind of whole of the country is, is taken on board. And it's wonderful for us. Uh, we prevent, we uh, promote events all year long. And it is really nice to be able to get out of the central belt and see a bunch of uh, new performers, or hear a bunch of new voices. Uh, it's been a huge thing that we've been doing last year. We had three partner organizations. Uh, this year we've expanded it to five, which includes uh, uh, coming up to Inverness. And in no small part, Thank you to Hamish McDonald. Big round of applause for Hamish. <laughs> who is, uh, he has been our, our Inverness liaison uh, and has been very uh, helpful in, in spreading the word up here and keeping us informed and putting us in touch with the bike shed and stuff like that. So we are very, very pleased uh, to have him here as one of our judges. That's right. There is judges. How does a slam work? What is going on? Some of you might be asking. Well, it is not all me shouting into a microphone and making you go, ooh, as much as I enjoy that. Uh, a good panto crowd you are. Uh, it is about the slammers. We have... <laughs> uh, we have... <laughs> we have 10 wonderful uh, slammers that are going to be coming up to the mic. Uh, the way it will work is we will uh, have 10 slammers in the first round, then we will have six slammers in the second round, and then we will go down to a final three in the third round and then we will announce a runner-up and a winner uh, the runner-up and winner will both go to the grand slam final but the winner this evening will get 200 quid which is a bit anticlimactic after i've already said 3,000. <laughs> should have done them the other way around but still 
kind of cool. Uh, so that is very exciting. And the way to decide who gets the cash, who makes it to the Grand Slam final, is with our judges. So our first judge is Loud Poet and part of I Am Loud Productions, the wonderful Mark Galley. <laughs> He is uh, also the man behind the camera, double duty this evening for Mark. Uh, so the more, you know, in frame you are, the scores may improve. So uh, play to the camera for his his enjoyment. Uh, our second judge, as we pointed out, is the wonderful Hamish McDonald. Uh, who, as well as being just a wonderful poet and our liaison to the, <laughs> I'm going to keep saying it that way, uh, to Inverness, is uh, a former Scottish slam champion and is representing Scotland all over the world. He is real coming up and all that good stuff. He has, yeah, been a wonderful ambassador for the scene. Hey, and our third judge is the spectacular Josie Alpha. <laughs> Josie, uh... Josie, I have been a huge fan of for a very long time. She's a Bristol-based poet. She was up last night with us at our home at the Scottish Storytelling Centre doing uh, some wonderful poems for the folks there. She, as well as being an amazing poet, does a huge amount of uh, content online helping people get into writing. She does workshops and podcasts and tutorials and all this wonderful stuff. She's one of our favourite people and she's more, more than qualified to judge the slam. She is our, our third judge. So those are the judges. They're going to be scoring it. You guys don't need to worry about scores, though. That is not your job. We got the professionals in for that. All you guys need to worry about is having a good time, supporting the poets, being encouraging. I can tell you from firsthand experience, slams are fucking terrifying. Uh, they're really scary. You are putting your stuff out there and you are literally being scored for it, which is kind of like the most intense way you can put your art out there. Uh, it's really good because slams pull in an audience, they get people interested and they bring you here to listen to these poets' amazing poems. But you guys don't need to worry about judging them, just enjoy everyone, give everyone your support, everyone your love. And no matter who wins, who the runners up are, I hope you support them as they go into the Grand Slam final. It would be very, very cool to see some people make it down to Edinburgh for the, the final. If not, all the slams are going out online. So you can watch back the Highland Slam, you can share it with your mates, you can check out the competition if you want to. Uh, and kind of follow along, which would be very cool. It was it was something we were very keen to do, was make it that you could enjoy the whole Slam series. The final, if you can't make it down, will be going out for free on our YouTube channel. You'll be able to check it out and see how your champions do. Uh, it's very, very exciting. I'm also aware that this microphone isn't making any noise. Uh, you might be looking at me like I'm crazy. That's fine. Because we're recording, we have the microphone. Uh, so this is picking up sound for them. We don't have the PA system here because you can hear it just fine. Uh, so if, if you're thinking your hearing's going, it's not. It's all showbiz illusion. Uh, so just play along. It'll be fine. Uh, but yeah, that is how the slam works. Is everyone excited for some slam? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you who's not excited. The slammers. They're terrified. Uh, and so what we tend to do for our slammers is we have a sacrificial poet, someone whose job it is to come up here to the mic, warm it up, and get that kind of first poem out of the system. Get all you guys settled in so that the slammers can have a, a good uh, energy in the room to come up to. And you could not have a better sacrificial poet to set the tone to get you guys into the slam than the wonderful, the spectacular, Josie Alpha! <laughs> Hello, hello. This feels so weird talking into a microphone that isn't amplifying my voice. Showbiz. Um, thank you so much for having me. I've never been to Scotland before, but I actually really love it. And you're all really friendly and nice, which even Bristol's a friendly city, but um, no, you guys are lovely. Um, so this is going to be my sacrificial poem. It's one that I did um, last night in Edinburgh and it seemed to go down quite well. So I thought I'd do it again. It's called October the 6th um, and it's about the day that we scattered my dad's ashes. And I just want to preface this um, by saying this is a funny poem and you are allowed to laugh. Um, I just want to get that out of the way because when I perform it without that intro, people get a bit nervous. Um, basically, everyone thinks that the ashes scattering or the burial or anything like that is going to be this deeply sentimental and profound moment. Um, or some might say poetic, um, and uh, often is just not. Um, and the reality is quite different. So this is called October the 6th. 
They put him, or the sand that was him, in a paper bag, sellotaped closed, in what could have been a shoebox. And they put that shoebox in a gift bag. My sister put it, him, on the back seat, did the seatbelt up, <laughs> joked, safety first. <laughs> we originally planned to do it off the cliff, but decided against it when Granny said she didn't want him blowing down the beach like a piece of old rubbish. So we waded into the sea in October. I read somewhere that they burn several bodies at once, that the beige dust you get is not entirely your loved one. That is not true. I Googled it after writing this poem, but I kept it in because that line is morbid as all hell. <laughs> we left them, my father and the people he burned with, not true. at the far end of the bay in the rock pools. My brother, sister and I left our family, his family, on the October sand. The sea had lost its summer. I wore the black t-shirt he bought me in Tennessee. Elvis has left the building. Clutching the box filled with our father or the remains that were him, we struggled with the sellotape, the sodden paper. I wanted to laugh, I think, when we unwrapped him like fish and chips. <laughs> Izzy held him, it, up. Go on then. What? Scoop him out then. <laughs> I got my father under my nails. The wind caught him and threw him back. I think I ate a bit. <laughs> and then it was over. And I tried not to think about baptism as the sand that was ash, but was also my father, ebbed. Our congregation stood at a respectful distance in their side, their winter coats. And we joined them, falling into silence. And the sea, or the moment, or the wind, or grief, or the pressure to look like grief held us until it didn't anymore. Thank you so much. Give it up for Josie Alper! All right, guys, we are going to jump right into the slam. I am going to read out the running order, and then I will uh, kind of come up in between and let everyone know, because the slammers will zone out and be uh, it'll be fine. Uh, so the running order is going to be Lindsay Gilmore, Jennifer Morag henderson Jack Hunter, Chloe McDonald, Cece O'Hara, Sandra Proctor, Myra Ross, Jill Shaw, Sam Steele, and Louis Watson. Those are your slammers. Woo! So... We have Jennifer Morag Henderson on deck, but kicking things off. Please give all the love to Lindsay Gilmore! Fiskelma. Um, I want to hear the stories of this rock before I go. The tales of quarreling giants and shipwrecks and wraiths and beasts of the sea the ones that disquiet and discomfort and settle softly somewhere in your soul. Bring to me the bards and the shenachies and tell me tales of the brochs and the dunes and the battles, Etherin, of the raven and the dog and the eagle and the fox that endure still points on a map. Crekaniach, crekachion, bain na hiljere, crekavatarui. Their names corrupted and mangled, but recognisable still for the keepers of the keys and the codes and the stories. I need to hear the song of the streams, yellow, red, black, pale, Alpuye, Aldruach, and Aldu and Alban, as they course down crags through gullies and glens, Tor, Skur, Goer, Cor and Glaum. The wild water horses and the sweet song of the Sheehan in the hills, Come closer, 
lean in. Join their dance if you dare. I don't need your princes on white steeds. They are not my heroes. And I don't want your fairy godmothers because we had nothing as sweet and wholesome that year. You can print pretty pink posy pouted princesses and everything from curtains to coffee cups, but those stories are not our stories. As easy as they are to package and sell. We've got our own. They live in our hills and on our shorelines, and they were once a warning to our children. They made sense of seasons and cycles and sickness and success. They were a call to community, to cohesion, to communion. They were a war cry and a victory song. They were a eulogy. They're written in our stars and across the hills that frame our landscapes and each field, well, spring and burn. Do the Shenikis tell tales now about the rusting steel giants that walk down our firths with their tiny lights like eyes keeping watch over the sleeping barons? Are they friends, these giants? Or will they call the seas to rise against us and put us from our homes again? Are your bards writing praise to the elegance and grace of the towering pylons that are marching down the straths? And will we hear their words anyway over the hum of the electricity that's travelling south through our crofts and our gardens? It's a vein draining and bleeding our people as quickly as it's draining our resources. So bring to me your poets and your storytellers, your musicians, your singers, your dancers, your mackers and screevers and your bothy balladeers. I need the bodics and the calics, bring the bairns and the ballocks and the waifs and the strays, the dirty stopouts, the bidey ins, bring your hearts and bring your hope. Tell them your old stories, tell them your new stories, shout them, sing them, loud, proud. We won't be cowed and we need them now more than ever. On deck, we have Jack Hunter, but making to their way to the stage just now, Jennifer Morag Henderson! Hello. Um, so mainly I write about history. Um, I grew up in Culloden, which maybe gives you an idea why that made me interested. Um, but maybe growing up in a place like that, you maybe have a little bit of a less romantic view of it than some people. Um, this poem is called Holding the Memory Tight Like an Emigrant. When he heard my accent, he leaned in close, suddenly excited, breathless for his homeland. Sorry. I'm a bit nervous. I'll start again completely. So this is, it's a poem for, um, about something that happened when I was in Canada. When he heard my accent, he leaned in close, suddenly excited, breathless for his homeland. He explained that he was Scottish, eh? His accent impeccable East Coast Canadian. A proud MacLeod out of the Isle of Skye, he was thrilled to hear I was a Highlander. He asked about his clan chief, and I said I'd heard the chief was selling off the Coolins. The Sky Island Mountains were almost Japanese. Then, backtracking quickly to salvage something out of his shattered expression, I tried to laugh it off with a land reform joke. <laughs> his face turned serious. This was a full-on Scottish fetish. I felt almost unworthy, a second-rate patriot, seeing all my homeland's homely flaws and too eager to expose them, not holding the memory tight like an emigrant. Then he leaned back and, as the grand finale, lifted up his shirt to show a full Canadian Manchester-size MacLeod tattoo. On deck, we have Chloe McDonald, but coming to the stage right now, please give all the love to Jack Hunter. Hello, nice to see you, nice to be seen. Um, this is a cautionary tale about baking. 
Bob the Bonnie Baker's boy, born and bred in Bankry, bewitched by the brilliance of brioche buns. Now a bullish, brazen businessman, beguiled by the bombastic benefits of big business. Boastful in his behaviour and bashful in his bureaucracy, Bob boldly buys out the Bankry Bakery. Bountiful baked booty butters Bob's bloated bank balance. Bilaterally, Bob's bewildered brow-beaten bakers bunker brittly above the bread line. The bakers beseech Bob for the betterment of their bankroll. Bullshit! <laughs> Blasts Bob, berating the bra- bakers, branding him Bolsheviks. Bake for Bob or bounce back to the brew, the bastard boss barks. Bollocks! Bite back the bakers, baying for Bob's blood. Boldly banding into a battalion, benefactors of their battlement, they best the beast of business. Bob the baker's boy's bust is balanced on a bloody block. The baker's bolster, a behemoth baked battle axe baguette. Bob begs the bakers for their begrudgingly benevolent blessings, but before Bob the bonny baker's boy can barter his bail, BAM! <laughs> Bob the baker's boy is beheaded, his brain bludgeoned by the brutalist baguette. This book ends the ballad of Bob the bullying, bemoaning Bankry businessman, a bygone Bonnie Baker's boy baked into brown bread. Bloomin' brutal. <laughs> On deck, we have CC O'Hara, but coming to the stage now, please give it up for Chloe McDonough! Uh, so this poem is called Scapa Flow. Oh. I am watching us crash the car. There should be more sounds, I think, other than that desperate whine of the brake pedal and the far off hum of a song I can't listen to anymore. In the wake of the inevitable, there's nothing to say. I kind of thought in moments like these, those moments that wrench time in bloodied fists and stretch its spine out, the before and after, that, oh my God, in another world, I'm fucking dead. A moment so big, there's little room for much else. Well, I kind of thought my life would flash before my eyes, like the movies said. I think nothing at all, really. Nothing apart from one aching thought. I wish I could see your face one last time, just in case, but it's true what they say about car crashes. It's hard to look away. A mini apocalypse, a flash bomb, the air vibrates, hospital wall white vision. For a brief moment we fly, our bodies leave ourselves and come back again, dazed. Airbags burst. My ears are ringing. At least the movies were right about that. Your glasses were broken and we hadn't even realised it yet and that was more important to me than the car burnt out at the side of the road or the ache in my hand that still throbs now in the cold and your glasses were more important to me because you're more important to me. Sometimes things don't need to hide behind metaphor, they just are. I get what you mean when you said I make you want to make your writing worse. I understand why now in the crash that made my dad deaf, they said my brother was scrambling around on the ground for his glasses in the aftermath. It's the little things. And when my other brother stole that car and smashed it to fuck, smashed it right into a brick wall and said, I knew I'd be okay. I knew nothing bad could ever happen to me. And my driving instructor called me Mad Max's daughter. And like the men in my family, I've skirted the line too many times, felt that bitter aftertaste on my palate. And my brother died when I was 17 anyway. And you already know this story. It's burnt into my shadow. I had a drink once with an old friend in a country far away from prying eyes and she's maybe one of the only people to understand because her dad used to be a criminal too and she said, I wish I was doing what he did. My life is so fucking boring. And we laughed, manic like, two girls with brutes for heroes. And when I looked at you then, in the pitch black on an archipelago I wasn't sure we'd get off of, wasn't sure if there was even anything else to the world other than this, I knew I could never be the men in my family. I can't be dangerous like that. 
It's unfair. I'm too scared. I love too hard. That's the long and short of it. On deck, we have Sandra Proctor, but give it up now. Keep that applause rolling. Keep it building for CC O'Hara. CC O'Hara. For CC O'Hara. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. Uh, I'm CC O'Hara. This is a poetic Kevlar. It wasn't bought in a gay fetish shop in West Hollywood 15 years ago, and I can't believe it still fits. Lockdown belly. Um, May West said the role of the poet is to fall in love as often as possible. So with that in mind, um, this is my poem called Bone. The lovers came in, removed their clothes and unzipped their skin put off their flesh and tendons to a pile of muscles and bloody sinew. Entrails and lungs, nerves, heart and liver being more than naked made them quiver. Next came their eyes and out went their tongues cause bony love is more than just fun. Phalanges gripped phalanges, mandibles met their match. The skeleton lovers held each other and whispered, what a catch. Dancing bone to bone, they bring it on home. Rolling and tumbling, bumping and grinding, slipping and sliding, clacking and jiving, smooth, satisfying. Endlessly soften to loosen the sorrow. Infiltrate osteon deep in the marrow. Skeleton joy heaves emotional harrow, sending out love into every tomorrow. Yeah. On deck, we have Myra Ross, but please give it up now for Sandra Proctor. Hi, this is called Protected and Pretty. Do you feel protected and pretty? Like those women on the TV? I do you have, oh, I've forgotten already. <laughs> uh, and I have done this so many times. Um, so I'll just put these on in there. Here we go, start again. Do you feel protected and pretty? Like those women on the TV? Are you glad to know there's no wet patch when you accidentally pee? <laughs> Do you have a drawer full of panties and pads that turn liquid into a gel? Are you glad to know that they lock liquid in so you don't get that old lady smell? <laughs> Do you suffer from dry vagina now you're going through menopause? Are you glad to know there's a cream you can use to get to the root of the cause? But what if you have vaginosis? It's not always easy to tell. You'll be glad to know there's a test you can buy from the chemist at Tesco's as well. <laughs> Do you have an itch that needs soothing? Have you heard of caniston cream? You'll be glad to know you can get rid of thrush with caniston. Works like a dream. <laughs> Are you aware if you use Tampax to deal with those heavier flows? that you'll still be able to ride on a bike or wear a white suit in the snow. <laughs> Do you want to have an orgasm? Do you believe that is your right? Well, Durex are there to assist you to reach those incredible heights. They have a new product for women, one that's been a long time coming, one that will help you achieve your desires and leave you all throbbing and humming. <laughs> And let's not forget, while we're at it, here's something else you never knew. When you get to be over 40, <laughs> you need to use special shampoo. Are you glad that you are a woman? Are you glad to know all these things? Are you glad when watching those adverts to know that whatever life brings, there is a solution that's waiting right there in the pharmacy aisle 
That's where you'll find all of the answers to womanhood's troubles and trials. Then you'll feel protected and pretty, like those women on the TV. And no one will ever find out if you accidentally pee. <laughs> Guys, we have Jill Shaw on deck, but coming up now, please go wild for Myra Ross! Poetry and parenthood came at the same time, questioning everything I ever thought I had known, and now I've got to try and play with this thing, so let's see if that works. That'll do. Did better than me. Be proud. <laughs> This is called War or Peace. Today he told me the story of a war that had begun. Someone breached his borders and he challenged them and some. He stood his ground, he stared them down. The battle had been won and I, I shed a tear for a war had now begun. I sat him down and I spoke to him of all the pride I felt. Well done son, be strong and stay true to yourself. I told him how it mattered as we walk along our way to build and keep your borders, find your voice and have your say. I told him that the monsters I most fear coming for him hunt for easy prey where the boundaries lie thin. I told him all the reasons he should now stand big and tall and I braced for the pain that would now come with his fall. I told him all the good news before I shared the bad. You won the battle, son, but the other side, they're mad. Mad you showed them up, son, making them look weak. Bitter is the taste of humility defeat. Mad they couldn't break down your boundaries, your wall. Mad they failed to make you submit, retreat or fall. Mad, but not just that, son. It's not all about you. This is now about what the others saw you do. The others, they were watching as you served up your no. The others, they were watching and you gave them quite the show. The others, they were watching and you showed them what to do when power tries to breach a boundary in you. You told them all the story of how the world could be if we could all say no, no, I'll decide for me. You told them all the story and son, there's something more. The herd might now stampede and they'll need to bolt the door. They need to spin the story, son, rein the whole herd in. This is how we do things in rebellion, it's a sin. They'll beat you with the stick that they'll use to draw the line. An example will be made of this loving boy of mine. But son, this was your victory and it will be your fall. Lose some face, dent your pride, son, but don't lose it all. War makes you lose sight of what matters most to you and war can blur your vision, son, and harden up your heart. War destroys our lives, son. War tears us apart. War and no one wins it. War ends in defeat. War is just destruction, and in time, son, both sides meet. Meet to build a peace, son. Meet to now move on. Both met with defeat, son. It's a war, and no one won. In time, someone will climb down, and someone will give ground. A truce will be called, son, and a compromise will be found. Peace, however fragile. Peace amid the loss. Peace is made by leaders, son, and war by I'm the boss. Choose your battles wisely, and the wise avoid the war. The war may take away all that you were fighting for. Yeah. On deck we have Sam Steele, but making their way to the stage now, please give a huge ovation to Jill Shaw! Thank you. This poem is about my son. I have an incredible kid who I co-parent with my ex-wife. And this poem is a quietly ragey response to the suggestion that non-biological mothers are not real mothers. Motherhood is more than biology. It's more than the forms that you sign to consent to conception of your kid. It's the hope you inject into someone else's body with the drugs. It's the eight IUI and the four DSI and the one IVF, the one that works. It's the kick you can feel inside 
someone else's belly. It's maroon scrubs and the weight and the glare and the cut and the blood and the cry. That first cry that cracks your heart so the love can pour out. It's every drop of milk you feed from a thimble-sized cup in the dark. It's the squeeze of four tiny fingers round your pinky with room to spare. It's the hours that you rock and you walk and you sing and you drive him to sleep. It's the finger. He holds your finger. He holds as he takes his first steps. It's the climb that he makes to your lap when he cries. It's the poetry book he adores and the language he learns that is yours. It's the gestures he copies like the way you fold clothes. It's the finger he slips up your sleeve when his eyes start to close. It's not the blood that runs through his veins or the colour of his eyes or the makeup of his jeans. It's not the point of his teeth or the curl in his hair or the length of his toes or the fact you're not there all the time. If you could, you'd be there all the time. It's the way mama sounds as it rolls off his tongue. I am his mama and he is my son. Yeah. We have come to our penultimate poet. Please give all the love to Sam Steele. Good evening. This poem was inspired by one of the greatest things to come out of American 20th century culture, the Muppets. <laughs> the poem is called Morning in Morning with Noon at Twilight. My friend, a knight, had passed on. Uh, this gets a little bit complex. And I had a lengthy train ride to pay my last respects. Now, my pal's last day, day was, days were in healthcare at the Twilight Home for Seniors. And because he was a Catholic, it was funeral by Monsignor. Now, this friend had lived in mourning, and the funeral was tomorrow. Oh, I tell you, that was just the start of all my grief and sorrow. I phoned the care home number and asked, the service is what time of day? It's by noon, here's our Monsignor, at twilight, they did say. So the twilight home for seniors in a burial at noon from a friend the night and senior who died the 1st of June. <laughs> yeah, I might not make it till afternoon. Could they have the service then? No, the service is at twilight. That's not the place, but it's the when. So not a service for the senior night at the twilight home at noon, but by noon, who's a Monsignor, the service at the rising moon. Oh, the services at twilight. That's the when, but not the where. Yes. <laughs> Do you think you could catch a train and somehow make it there? <clears throat> well, there's no train from here to morning tomorrow to get me to morning by noon. But I can get to morning if I first go tomorrow. And I think that train leaves fairly soon. So because there's no train to morning tomorrow, I must go tomorrow today. Today out tomorrow, then tomorrow to morning, but after a one night stay. I think I've got it. Correct me if I'm right. <laughs> I don't need the morning for grieving in morning, but should get to morning by noon to say bye to a knight who lived at twilight but passed on on the first day of June. Now I don't have to sweat because not to sunset is a service by noon the Monsignor. So tomorrow in morning, there'll be morning at twilight, a knight who's with us no more. But to go see the night, I must head out tonight, tomorrow where I have to stay, then in the morning to morning, from morrow to morrow, but after a one night stay. I have to admit, I was slow to get it, and by the time it was set in my brain, all the fuss and chaos just made my eyes cross. And sadly, I missed that one train. <laughs> Thank you. Too hot to wrap my brain around that poem, Sam. You have broken me. I only need to remember one name and it's impossible to get out. Oh, guys, we have reached our final poet of the first round. Please give all the love to Louis Watson! Cool. Felt like Abdi. There is a lot of Abdi, is there? <clears throat> Um, uh, sorry that you're missing Eurovision to be here. I, uh, I've got a severe lack of sequence going on. Um, my apologies. Um, this is a poem called Notch on My Belt. Thanks. 
Under the rain of a dark summer night, the evening evolved never to be truly resolved. She was a girl I knew, and we had had a few, the knowing looks they flew, and we both knew. Except I knew nothing, my school tie still firmly around my throat, only she really knew what we were going to do. An awkward fumble after a midnight stumble, under our breaths we mumble, even though the streets had stopped their rumble. In the dim lamppost glow, she starts her show. Our lips lock, her hands are on my cock. My thoughts soar, fly, flock. I become a sheep. A 17-year-old kid who isn't ready to fuck someone he doesn't trust, but then thinks he must. Pull down to the ground, behind the bins, between the rubbish mound. And I try desperately to make a sound. Try to force it out and up, past the clattering heart, through the fear and... And... And finally, the sound tries to start, forcing its way through my throat that feels like it's closing up, escaping its terrified cage. The no passes my lips and caresses her lips. The no passes my lips as she unzips. The no passes my lips as she grabs my hips. Pulling me into the cocoon of her legs, but I don't feel safe here. I've got no protection, only a pulsating sore direction that I don't know how to use. The no passes my lips as she puts me inside where I have nowhere to hide, trying desperately to find myself, but only getting lost, thrusting into the soggy mud, my knees driving into the dirty land. Her old experience takes my hand. It's okay, I'm on the pill. Within seconds, I spill. I spill everything. Mortified. I melt into her, but not gently. I fall with little grace, a virgin-like disgrace, a shaken, embarrassed wreck. I try to apologise, but I cannot even look her in the eyes. I spill everything. Mortified. But before I know it, we're face to face, holding hands and walking home. I've forgotten her demands. They are a thing of the past. I just had sex, even though I didn't last. A notch on my belt to prove I'm a man and I can do anything. But I wasn't a fucking man and I wasn't fucking ready. I went home and slept in my single bed in the arms of my childhood toys, but it was tainted and something had changed. Forced into something that I'll never get back. Forced into her, forcing myself to be okay with it. And I am fed up in they playing the victim. Because I am a victim. A shaken, apologising victim in a non-consensual sexual gauntlet that I was not ready to take on. And I'm sorry to myself for not seeing the signs, for not reading between the lines. And I don't hate you for what you did. But I'm not sorry anymore. Thank you very much. Cheers. Wow, what a first round. Uh, Man, that was uh, amazing. I've been saying that I've been blown away by all of the slams and uh, you are very much up on the list of uh, pleasant surprises. Like I said, I I don't know many of the poets uh, signed up for a slam and that's both one of the uh, wonderful things about slam and one of the terrifying things about slam when you're hosting them. Uh, And this is just absolutely delightful to see uh, so many different styles, approaches, subject matters all addressed uh, in sort of one community of poets. That is a beautiful thing. If you have not been to a lot of spoken word shows, if you're here supporting a pal, then huge points to you because that's just a nice thing to do. But also I hope you see that. Like it is, I am a, a huge advocate for spoken word for that exact reason. And I think slams often give you the clearest picture of why spoken word is such a powerful art form. And it is because you see everything. There are poems that will make you laugh, cry, that will challenge you, that will make you think, that will you know, drive you, inspire you, anything like that. And you see it all in one spot. And I don't think any art form does that quite as well as spoken word does. So can we just get a huge round of applause for all of your first round slammers. And uh, I do feel like I should apologize to the judges. Uh, Sorry, guys. Uh, uh, This is why I very much enjoy hosting and not judging. Uh, 
just like I reiterated, I said at the start, uh, and I, I spoke to the post about this, the points in slams, they would change if you ran the exact same slam again. Uh, so just for the audience, you guys know, this is not a, 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 a who goes through will not be a statement on who the best poet is, but, uh, you know, what the judges were feeling at that particular moment. I hope you know that, like, there will be fractions of points in it because that was a very, very high quality first round. Hey, while the math is done and the judges shower me with hate uh, what I'm going to let you guys do is take a little break go and grab something from the cafe have a cigarette hug a pal tell a poet you like their stuff and we will see you about 20 to 9 alright see you in the second half hello 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 welcome back to the second half of the Loud Poets Highland Slam Oh, thank you so, so much for coming back. Uh, that's always a good sign. Uh, that is wonderful. Did everyone get a drink and a, a smoke and a hug and a chat with a pal? <laughs> Just one sad no. Uh, <laughs> hey, guys, I, I, I said it at the end of the first half. I'll say it again. That was an absolutely uh, stacked uh, first, first round. Uh, all of the judges separately came to complain to me so that always take that as a, in a very good way i always take that as a good sign hey i know it is fra <clears throat> fractions of point i had some seven up and now it's ruined me uh fractions of points in between everybody so yeah yeah whoever gets through it could have been absolutely anyone in that lineup but i do have the names and i can feel the poet's eyes boring into me so i am going to get straight to the names uh, what's going to happen is i'm going to read out the uh six people who are through to the next round uh, and then to give them a bit of a time to compose themselves we are going to have a wonderful feature set from our sacrificial poet josie alford so the six names going through and what i'll do is i'll read all the names and then we'll do one big cheer all right because otherwise it ends up all this weird and yeah so we will do all the six names and then a big whoop. Uh, and they will be performing in this order. So it'll be kind of the reverse order to the last round, okay? So, kicking off will be Louis Watson, followed by... We do one big cheer at the end! Some Louis fans in the house losing their minds! Uh, we have Louis Watson, Sam Steele, Jill Shaw, Myra Ross, Jack Hunter, and Lindsay Gilmore! Can we just get one big round of applause for all of our poets who didn't make it through to the second round? Such good work. While those poets frantically decide what they're going to do next, uh, I am going to hand over to the very capable hands of our sacrificial poet. You saw her early kick off the slam. I know you're going to love her. Please give it up for Josie Alpha! Um, I'm so glad Lewis mentioned Eurovision because when I agreed to come to Scotland, I didn't check my dates and I hadn't put Eurovision in my calendar, which I normally always do. So I was like, yeah, I'm free. And then two weeks ago, I realised and I was like, it's definitely too late to call Kev and ask to do a different <laughs> month. Um, but I've bullied all of the boys to go back to our Airbnb and watch the results afterwards. And I watched the semi-finals for the first time ever this year. Um, Island did not deserve to get through. And like that band getting funny that they didn't get through is terrible. <laughs> if you're gonna wear a gold jumpsuit like that, like work it. <laughs> and if you don't know what I'm talking about, go back and YouTube it and you'll be like, she was right, she was right. <laughs> um, so this is my debut poetry collection. It came out in March, so it's a brand new little baby. And I have three copies, including this one, because Edinburgh was super keen and bought far more than I thought. Um, but they will be for sale at the end if you want them. And if more than three people want a book, um, I'll give you guys a discount code so you can buy it from my website and I'll post it to you as soon as I get home. Um, but enough of the capitalism. Let me share some poetry with you. <laughs> Um, so my first poem is the first poem in the book and it is called Widmouth Bay. Um, if any of you have ever been to Bude in North Cornwall, it is the better beach a couple of miles out from that town. Um, and it was a beach that meant a lot to us. Um, and so my dad died on December 20th and on Boxing Day I went there. Um, and I didn't want to write a poem. I was so much in my grief that I wanted to not write a poem. But of course I did because I'm a poet and a twat. So, 
This is called Widmouth Bay, and if you ever want to Google it, it's spelt wide mouth, but you will out yourself as not from round Yarra if you pronounce it <laughs> wide mouth. So it's Widmouth for the locals. There was the swell. The sets kept coming, but there was no one there to surf them. The man who had a family on these cliffs, who held feasts and raised cans in praise of the waves, was gone. The sand shared its memories of cigarette butts and handmade surfboards. The sea remembered sunrise surfing and sunsets with green flashes. The, the cliffs spoke of chess games and all night parties. I sit, as I always have, studying the sea, which perpetually throws itself back towards me. Thank you. So um, my dad was a bit of a dick. Um, and so this collection sort of explores what it is like to grieve for someone with whom you had a complicated relationship. And I like to share a grief fact with you all, uh, which is grief does not just mean sad. The meaning of grief is just the emotional response to loss. Um, and so no matter how you feel in that moment, that is exactly how grief is supposed to be. Because uh, I remember when I found out the first emotion I had was relief and then immediately guilt for, what am I, a psychopath? My dad just died. Why am I relieved? Um, but yeah, so this is, uh, this next poem is called An Awfully Big Adventure. And um, I was saying on the drive up here that the Highlands really put Dartmoor to shit. <laughs> I like, I grew up right near Dartmoor and I th thought, oh, these are nice hills. And then I came up here, I was like, shit. <laughs> um, and I, I picked it based on that because uh, it mentions Dartmoor, but yeah. The last time it snowed in Devon, we don't get a lot of snow down there, so it's kind of a big deal. The last time it snowed in Devon, my father piled his landlady, her boyfriend, her daughter and my little brother into his ramshackle van and set off for Dartmoor. They sledged all afternoon on bin lids, recycling bags and dinner trays. The next day, in his cleverness, he, brought three, he bought three sledges for his three children and waited for the snow to come back. After he had been put into boxes, we found years of lost boys' toys gathering damp, broken remote control helicopters, an inflatable kayak, power kites, and three unused sledges. When the snow finally came and the country stopped under it all, I sold them to a beaming man whose son had never seen snow before. So this next poem is called April 18th and um, there's a few date poems throughout the collection and the idea with that was <laughs> I got tired of coming up with titles but also uh, it, it sort of I tried to capture the idea that grief feels different on different days and April the 18th was the first day that I felt the traditional sad as I like to call it um, and so yeah this is that day. Dear Dad, today I miss you. I keep thinking about all the things that are going wrong and I know you would have been able to fix it. All I'd have to do is call you mid-morning, both of us at work, and hope you hadn't started the first can of Stella before your syllables became blurred and you randomly paused mid-sentence because you forgot that I was there. When you were sober, I learnt so much. You had knowledge on the most hodgepodge of things. You'd listen to me too. Would want to learn about my day and hear the latest thing I'd written. You wouldn't like what I'd written recently. You'd probably hang up and never talk to me again. So I'm glad it's 
good that you can't. But today, I miss you. I just want to hear your fucking laugh and the click and hiss of a can being opened. Thanks. So yeah, my, my dad was maybe not the best dad, but he also had like the best advice for random stuff. And one of them was his capacity to put up with corporate bullshit. Uh, my mum, uh, she, when I was young, worked as a childminder and then was a teaching assistant. And she actually graduated and became a teacher the same year that I graduated from, from my degree. So we had like photos in our in our little graduation outfits and really cute, but she never really worked in a corporate workspace. And so getting advice for having to deal with that. And there's something about the language, right? About that space. It takes on like business speak as a whole thing. So this poem is called The Vernacular of Human Resources. And it, it sort of captures all of the, the bullshit that happens in it. And it comes in two parts. Part one, someone complained about me at work. So HR in its infinite wisdom got me to do a personality strength test in the hope that I would work better with others. My first strength is strategy. Apparently, I'm good at making decisions. HR asked me if any of my decisions had turned out less than perfect. Agreeing to this was certainly a mistake. I thought, no, I said, but depends on your philosophical definition of perfection, I added. My second strength is communication. Apparently, I'm good at talking to people, hosting and writing. Honestly, I was pleased until, according to the branded laminated flashcards, I can talk too much and don't listen. This is when I stopped listening. <laughs> My third strength is woo. I shit you not, it stands for winning others over. It's manipulation's prettier sister in a dress. <laughs> for me, there are no strangers, only friends I haven't influenced yet. My fourth strength is learner. Apparently, I learned the basic knowledge, but nothing in depth or worth knowing. My fifth strength is activator. Apparently, I start things, but rarely finish them. The word superficial was bandied around a lot. Now, there is a part two, and I realise it would have been funnier if I left it, said there was a part two, and then just not done it. But there is. <laughs> so I'm going to read it. I need your advice, Dad, because shockingly, of all the qualities I inherited from you, I didn't get your ability to understand this sort of nonsense. Because right now, I am in a place where I can turn my strengths into reasons why I'm a sociopath, and I need you. I need you to tell me that some HR mumbo-jumbo fuckery pseudoscience made to keep the work workforce compliant and productive did not completely suss me. Thank you. Yeah. How am I doing for time? How am I doing for time? I lent into a microphone that doesn't. <laughs> so embarrassing. Okay. Yeah? Yeah. All right. Two, one more, two more? Whatever you want. Oh, okay. I'm too much fun. Okay, great. Uh, I'm going to add one in then. This is called Family Christmas, and it's not to do with my family at all. It's the only one that has family in the title and isn't about them. Um, but I guess it, it's about finding your chosen family. A few good friends and I were stranded in Bristol. Father Christmas made each of us a stocking and each brought their own traditions. A tinseled tree surrounded by its wonderful life. Frozen, Monopoly, Scrabble. Stilton, quiches, speeches, and own brand brandy. That night, we played and talked and sipped, loved and laughed late into the darkness. Wrapped up in fairy lights and paper hats, we were hodgepodged together, the family we each chose, 
around a heavily laden, smiling table. Thank you. So I'm going to love you and leave you with my um, last poem, which is called Portrait of Widmouth Bay as an Unending Apocalypse. And I think I just wanted to say that, um, you know how some spaces hold a lot of memories, right? Well, Widmouth Bay has, holds a weird amount of memories for me. Like that's where my dad taught me to surf. It's where we hosted all my childhood birthday parties because I'm blessed to have a summer birthday. And um, it is where... I went as soon as I could get out of my ho grieving household and that's where I went to calm myself down. It is where I proposed to my husband. It is where we scattered my dad's ashes and last summer it is where my sister got married. So it's like, it's a big place for us. And um, last Christmas I went there again and um, I wrote this. They are planting Christmas trees in Cornish sand dunes to stop the ocean from reclaiming ground. But far away ice is already melting. She is rising with the heat and a few misplaced trees will not stop her. We try anyway in the hope that pines used to mountains dig deep and find purchase in the uncertainty of sand take root in a collection of broken things. Five years came whiplash fast. The beach is a different shape now. In the darkness of winter, we visit the spot we scattered him, raise toasts, give gifts, and decorate the branches. We try to our best to protect the dying wood from the violence of wet try to stop the move the world moving quite so fast thank you so much guys yeah. and good luck to all the slammers Amazing stuff, amazing stuff. You can see why I have wanted to bring uh, Josie up to Scotland for quite some time. It is uh, lovely getting to bring her up and it is lovely getting to bring her all the way up uh, into Inverness. And she did genuinely say that about like how Dartmoor can suck it, uh, which was very fun. It's been very entertaining this whole year, actually, bringing up uh, English poets and sort of driving them because we've been places like Dumfries and stuff. To get anywhere from Edinburgh, you have to just drive through beautiful countryside. And it's great bringing up like poets from London who haven't seen a tree in a decade. Just like... <laughs> Holy shit! Like, it's uh, really wonderful. Hey, uh, guys, are you ready for the second round? Uh, that is what I hoped you'd say. Uh, so we are going to get underway. Just to remind you, it is going to go Louis Watson, Sam Steele, Jill Shaw, Myra Ross, Jack Hunter, and Lindsay Gilmore. So please put your hands together, give all the love, and welcome your first slammer of the second round, Louis Watson! Uh, thanks, Abdi. That was nice. Thank you very much as well to you guys. Cheers. Um, sorry, that seems so ingenuine. Anyway, um, this uh, poem is called uh, Water Treading, which sounds like a shit version of Night Swimming by R.E.M., but I hope it's not. <coughs> <coughs> Treading the water, because there's no struggle here, no drowning, no Red Sea to part floating by like the Dead Sea, because we'd rather be dead. See? Zero hour purgatory, renting millstones weigh heavy on quarter life ricket bones on millennial structures. While others swap mattresses for government sanctioned spikes, a thorn in the side of the system while they try to distract us with their tax free corporate bikes, the same news cycle in this fucked up haven. The cost of living is rising. But can we afford the cost to life, the writings on the wall in this fortress of little solitude? Cars car crash through our screens daily. Our deathly dose of reality, the LCD blinds us like Oedipus. We see it's glaring, but our eyesight is failing. Keeps us tranquilized, a numbing projection to protect the would-be hated, a repackaged lie that we should all be 
mated. Red rags regale blinded bulls, making fools of us all. Crucifying the dying, willing the cross tied, a colonial knee on the neck, the bullet hole in the deck, the statistic washed ashore. Willing the cross tied, where there's nowhere left to hide, because there is a struggle here. It's not all just treading water, and like the regal swan on the pond, it's like the beast thriving in the palace, the cream that floats above us, the concrete ceiling built on a foundation of not feeling. We strive to stay alive. We yearn that it was better, but it feels like the rebellion's already extinct before it begun. Born in the fire, but extinguished by the system. Wanting to change, picking up for picket signs, but choosing the wrong lines. Cut up, but not cut up enough to change. Refresh the echo chamber, fill the void with processed fuel, but don't think about the process stuck in a stasis of fucking stating the obvious. Fucking stating the obvious. Sorry. I was just going to check my lines. I'm so sorry. First time I've done that one. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Conspiracies curl like smoke. Inhale, exhale. The linger floating up and bringing towers down. Stubbed out in the crushed can of the things we cannot understand. Create a disguise for the promised land, or at least an island of love, an Eden of sorts with low-hanging fruit and snakes wrapped around every branch. Thank you very much. And keep the applause building. Get that noise even louder as we welcome back to the stage, Sam Steele. I don't like mics. I, <laughs> I did an open mic a while back, and the undertaker came up to me and said, you didn't got any poems you could, I could read at a funeral? And I went, no, but I'll write you one. And I did. And then I wrote another one. And this is the third one I wrote. I called it, I Wish You Were Here. The air is crystal clear. There's only blue skies here. Mostly, it's the French who are the cooks. The lights are always green, red as roses ever seen. The real thing's so much better than the books. The crocuses all bloom from August until June. The grass can somehow cut itself each day. Dictionaries have no need to include a word like weed. The gardens are immaculate displays. There's no, uh, sorry, the crocuses all bloom from August until June. Sorry. Melody, what's the next line? So many books I've read in the biggest, softest beds. Lots of authors made it up here, by the way. And I tell you, it transpires that you can never tire. There's a chance to lie in every single day. My serve is like a pro. I could three-set Mackinra. Oh, damn, sorry. <sighs> compose, 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 and... The music here is great. Every night we stay up late. It's more than just a trumpet and the horn. And Gabriel's a hoot when he ad-libs on a lute. And for shows, he dresses up like Ozzy Osbourne. <laughs> There's no snow on the ground unless skiers are around. Three new colors feature in the double rainbows. There are no ticks and fleas. There are no stinging bees. And hell, of course, has taken the mosquitoes. <laughs> the Wi-Fi 7G, there's no address on TV. The remote can never find a place to hide. The high tech here is great. You should see him innovate. Remember, that Steve Jobs is on this side. I've met your sister Jane and your second cousin Wayne. In fact, I've met so many other guys, all the folks we knew. Well, it's short by one or two, like your mother. But that's hardly a surprise. It sounds just like perfection, so I guess I didn't reckon that being here is where I would belong. It's a super neighborhood. Almost everything is good. But for me, there is one major thing that's wrong. It's obvious, my love, that you fit in like a glove. Although I hope it's not too soon that you'll be here. You have so much life to live and so much more to give. But this place will not be heaven until you're here. Thank you. Yeah. Make some noise for Sam Steele! 
Guys, please keep that going. Keep it building up and welcome back to the stage, Jill Shaw. Thank you. I'm going to share a heartbreak poem and it's called Tattoo for an Ex-Lover or Heartbroken Lesbians Do Crazy Shit. <laughs> 450. I counted the days, squared the roundness of the number, see how it divides by three, by two, by 15 months there's something scratching under the surface of my skin, the sting of it brings me to Quan. He strokes the inside of my wrist with a razor of intimacy. A white square in the ceiling blinks the pulchral light. He bears down with black drone of drill, black bite of needle, black kiss of ink to carve the date we met into the headstone of my wrist. A touchstone for the longing left unmoored, adrift, asunder, scratching under the surface of my skin since hope lifted anchor, I touch. Two fingers to the black lines risen from the red sting, the black lines yet to sink beneath the surface of my skin. Tell myself this, this, this is me moving on. We continue on in the second round, guys. Please welcome back to the stage, Myra Ross. Oh, look, it's there when I need it. So this is called The Fire, The Witch and The Haunting. If I get too near the fire, please, my burns can start to sting. Although it's been some time since hot flames licked at them. Yes, I have a guard up now. Yes, there's water near. Yet flames left me with scars and my scars are shaped like fear. The fear comes in a memory, a warning, if you will. Fire burns you once, and it may burn you still. Is it in my subconscious mind it seems I have no choice? I hear no siren sounding, no loud internal voice. That well-known sinking feeling, a terror that crawls in. A familiar ghost, a haunting, poltergeist that lives within. An entity, it lifts me up and it throws my soul around and settles all my order, tears my safe, secure walls down. The ghosts of fires I walked through, the petrol people through, the winds of flies that fanned the flames, the height to which they grew. The standing naked, blistered, raw, the horror, terror, fear, the hollow hopes of help from those I knew were standing near. Scorched threads of hope they might be just, reach out a helping hand. The knife wounds of disloyalty, devoid, alone, I stand. The bullets of the friendly fire, my army now stripped bare. No more my comrades' heroes. They're a flock of sheep and they just stare. They stand and watch and hang their heads, all herded by the dog, without the wit to see beyond the smoke and mirror's fog. Alone they'd run and hide from me, reduced and not so big. They form the judge, the jury, yet they have no court, no wig. I stand back and I look again into an ash-filled grate. I weep, seep my frustration, 
at those steps I cannot take. I reach out for the lifeline I've clung to for so long. I call him and I sob. He asks, my darling, what is wrong? I tell him that it's here again, the ghost of woundings past, the fear of flames long gone cold, a trial held, not past. He tells me, please, my darling, don't, you're safe now, please don't cry. And I cling with all I have to this and my throne, I will not lie. The post-traumatic stress, the test disorder, if I may, in short means that the burns, the fire, the flames don't go away. I'm back now and the fire's out and the flames and the fear are cold. My mind goes to the witches burned with their stories still untold. We have reached the penultimate poet of the second round, so I need you to go ballistic for the bloody brilliant bard that is Jack Hunter! Whoa. The bloody thing. I'll do it down here. Um, right, let's, here we go. It's dexterity time. <laughs> is that it? Is that it? It's not. It's for the camera. Um, so, this next poem is a, a dual, dueling narrative poem. It's about living with a disability and um, versus inspiration porn. So here we go. It's a funny word, isn't it? Inspiration. But then again, so is constipation. What have I done to deserve this inflammation of the ego? Just because I got out of bed or because I don't have faecal matter dribbling down my leg. <laughs> We're not all forced to live in a garden shed. What do people think? That we all need to be spoon fed. And so what if we do? There's nothing miraculous about making a cup of tea or informing your PA, I need to go for a pee. It's just part of our everyday, okay? Oh, look at him, Maggie, traipsing through life. It's no right. <laughs> People still come out with this kind of tripe, thinking it's all right. It's not fun being a minority. We've got a monopoly on sympathy. But this isn't how it always has to be. Our only impairment is how we're viewed. So some people need to change their attitude. But I guess they aren't really to blame when we're portrayed on theatre and film as notoriously lame, provoking calls and utterances of, oh, what a shame. I mean, I'm not all bitter and twisted like Richard III. And to anyone that says I'm as witty and mindful as Professor Charles Xavier, that's just absurd. Do you know how vexing it is to be compared to one of the X-Men? <laughs> I still have to deflect inquisitive glares and grimacing stares. Sometimes people look at me as if I'm Quasimodo, and then I catch them shielding their faces as if I don't know. Not that I'm surprised, though. <laughs> Every day... We have to prove our very existence isn't a sin. Well, believe it or not, I'm no tiny Tim. <laughs> and when it comes to getting a job, the upside is it ain't me before you. Because the prevailing theory of everything is that we're not up to much good, which really is quite rude. But what really makes me want to give people the boot is when they keep staring at my left foot. This rose-tinted regressive rhetoric is nothing but popcorn tearjucker bullshit. And we've had enough of it. It's time we tackle the elephant man in the room. <laughs> Tokenism isn't part of an inclusive vision. Our only impairment is how we're viewed. Don't put us up on a pedestal. Just be cool. 
We have come to our final poet in the second round, so please keep that applause building. Get it going back up as we welcome back to the stage, Lindsay Gilmore! Thank you. Um, this poem is for a couple old school pals, um, one of whom's out there fighting a lot of demons and the other one who sadly lost her fight against the same demons fairly recently. So, um, We are all 70% water. You told me that the last time we met. We just empty and we refill and we empty and we refill and we never really leave. And we're all 70% water and the world is 70% water, and the water that's in me might have been the water that was in you, and the water that was in you might be the water that could be me, and maybe the water that was in me is the water that was her. And there she is. She's lying between us. She's a river that we have to ford. And I wonder, is that really your final triumph? The fact that there might have been a part of you still in her when she left? The fact that there was 70% of herself that she'd never be able to control, that never really belonged to her, and that she had no real defence against you, that you'd always seep into her, and that her skin was a seawall that you could breach on a molecular level. Or maybe that's not fair. You tell me that you were in a bubble and you were floating around the world in an amniotic sac and you were seeing things through a membrane, hearing things through a cellular wall. You were a spectre, you were a spectator, you were never really part of the world. But she ripped her way through the lamina and you weren't alone. And she promised you that you were more than the sum of a thousand diagnoses from a hundred doctors. And she was your navigator and she was your midwife. And I can see that you mean that right here and right now and under the fluorescent supermarket lights. And I wonder, when, you, when she was doing all that for you, what were you doing for her? I wonder how many men before you she thought she was saving and how many men she thought might save her. And how many times did she hope that someone might try and fit, fight through layers of tissue and blood and sinew and deliver her? But I don't see that. I ask you if you're writing and I can see something change behind your eyes and I used to be really good at that, you see, and I tell you that I remember, but I don't tell you that I used to really envy your talent and I really wish now that I had. I'll have some time soon, you say, and I'll write something for you and I'll send it to you, but I don't ask you to promise and you've never sent me anything. And we hug and we part and then later when I'm writing, there you are. We're all 70% water, and I know your percentages were out, and we're actually about 56 to 60% water, because I did Google it. <laughs> but the idea of it still coursing through me, and it's lapping at page after page of my notebook, and a part of you is a part of me. And I wonder whether this is theft, or is it plagiarism, or is it exploitation, or maybe this is your gift. Maybe it's a, a gift bobbing on my own current of words. Or maybe we're all just 70% water and a part of you might be part of me. And maybe there's a part of her that's still here with us both. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, wow, what a second round. That is... Uh... Again, apologies to the judges. Uh, <laughs> uh, guys, we are not going to take uh, a big break uh, between uh, these rounds because the math is going to get done. Uh, so I just wanted to mention a couple things real quick. Uh, if you are looking for more spoken word, I know there is a bunch of uh, good stuff going on in Inverness. If you are looking to kind of see the, the, the wider scene and stuff like that, uh, we have a YouTube channel uh, so you can kind of dive into a bit of spoken word in the comfort of your own home. Uh, I am Loud Pro, so we're a kind of production company, Loud Poets is part of I Am Loud Productions, uh, and we put out a whole bunch of stuff from our live shows, so all of these slams are going up on the YouTube, uh, individual poems from our live events, uh, the Storytelling Centre, uh, we have years of, of uh, footage uh, of, of 
poets from Scotland and beyond. Uh, and then we have uh, things like workshops, a wonderful workshop series run by Dr. Katie Ailes, uh, who couldn't be here this evening, but is his part of the team. Uh, we have uh, Return to Form, which was a, a kind of project we did during the, the sort of pandemic where we paired up poets and gave them a form and kind of challenged to them to see what they would, they would come up with. Uh, so if you're interested in seeing any of that, jump on the old YouTube. Uh, as Josie mentioned, she does have three books. So uh, if you're wanting any of those, come and see me after. I got a little card reader thing and I can uh, sort you out with that. Uh, so yeah, please do buy Josie's books. It would be lovely to send her back to Bristol with nothing but souvenirs. Uh, that would be wonderful. So please uh, do that. If you're interested in hearing more about Loud Poets, keeping up to date with all of that, uh, we have a mailing list you can sign up to. I have mailing list forms. We send like, I think, two emails a month just with like, what is going on? Also, Beck Sherwood, part of the team who also couldn't be here this evening, uh, they put together uh, an amazing amazing uh, sort of compendium of events that are going on all across the UK. So pretty much any spoken word night that wants to be in it is in it. Uh, we're trying to include as many as possible. If you check it out and see and you don't have a, a spoken word or your spoken word night's not in there, let us know because uh, we would love to include it. We're trying to point people to spoken word wherever they find it, not just loud poets, but all around. As I've already waxed lyrical about, I think it is an amazing thing and you should uh, get more of it wherever you can. So yeah, please do try check out all of those things. Uh, and while Gally is doing some math, I will do a poem. Uh, yeah, just before you do that, absolutely. Yes, there's an open mic here, right? Yeah, amazing. Shout out to the Bike Shed for doing that. It's uh, one thing that we know also well is the importance of open mics and, and safe spaces to come and try stuff out. Slams are very scary. Uh, they're, they're, they're a hard thing to do. Not everyone can, can go straight into a slam. Uh, we run an open mic in Edinburgh that we like to think is that kind of space as well where we can, you know, you can find your feet. And I always tell people when I do workshops and things like that, people ask like, Oh, what should you know? How is scary going to open mic? And I go, worst advice ever for a comedian is tell them you're new, they'll eat you alive. But at a poetry night, tell them it's your first time and watch the audience explode for you. Like the, the poetry scene is one of the most welcoming artistic communities I've ever come across. So go along to your local open mic. If this is it, what a wonderful space to have it in. They have been more than welcoming to us. So I know that the Friday end event will be amazing. So please do continue to support. We are going to be back in Inverness at some point in November, hopefully, hopefully at the bike shed. I'll be hitting you up. Don't you worry. Yeah. But yeah, we, we, we hope to continue to kind of come along. We also have a writing group. If if you're interested, our Patreon, uh, it's like a tenner a month. You get all the other Patreon things like access to videos and stuff. But we have a writing group, uh, the, the, the uh, one Wednesday every month. I think it's the first one. Time's a relative thing, isn't it? Uh, and so what we do is we have people from all across the country, Aberdeen, Dumfries, Dundee, uh, uh, Edinburgh and Glasgow, uh, all kind of taking part. They all come together on our Discord channel. They edit and help kind of put together each other's poems and we we all get together on a discord call and and kind of go through a workshop so if you're interested in that come up and have a chat that, that's the main thing to do hey uh, i will i don't need to do a poem good uh, inches. Yeah, yeah. cool so yeah a couple other things uh no no i won't <laughs> You can feel the poets go, no, no! <laughs> uh, it is worth doing these slams just for that moment every time. Uh, okay, so reading in this order, in the final, will be... You can do whoops for each one. <laughs> Going first will be... Lindsay Gilmore! <laughs> Second up to the mic will be... Jack Hunter! And our final poet in the third round will be Jill Shaw! Again, can we get a huge round of applause for everyone that didn't make it through to the final round? It is 
so difficult. Uh, it is tight, tight judging. And, uh, you know, Eurovision does it to us all. Don't worry. Uh, but yes, those are our three poets uh, in the final round. Give them everything you got, guys. They need some proper encouragement. They need all your energy. They need you to hoot, holler, clap, scream, go absolutely mental as I lose my voice. Help me welcome to the stage our first poet in the final round, Lindsay Gilmore! Thank you. Um, I told Jack earlier that my wee girl um, helped me decide which order to do my poems in and she said I should do this one last because you'll probably not get a chance to do that one anyway ma'am <laughs> so, <laughs> so <laughs> um and ye gail and a mammy and the question hangs between us like the har that's hanging low over the kyle today and it's a grey veil obscuring the view from our kitchen window and it's hiding the truth with the mountains for hyo for sclo for scoen Socher, savach. We have been working so hard, bent low over our workbenches, repairing the broken chains of transmission, link by precious link, hashing that hedra. Ach, before you ain't got easier in a minute. We should have been and we could have been splicing nets and mending creels because, as precious as our language is, it's a museum piece divorced from our culture. A dochas, a dive, a doich. Hashi na runerin. Noting and cataloguing and standardizing orthographies and grammar conventions and clickety, clackety, clickety, clackety, clickety. Ach, becholgeinger crossed in a vinen. We could have been digging and sowing and planting and growing and mending and tending and lending and telling stories and singing songs because, as beautiful as our music is, it loses its joy when it moves from kitchens and fields and Cayley houses. And it's sung in a four-part harmony by a choir on a wet Wednesday afternoon in Oban. <laughs> because if you still can't comfortably wear that identity, and if you have to ask, can we halt the dreek, relentless drift of faceless, placeless, accentless monoculture? Do we get time? Are we enough? A version, Jeshel, Jonach, version Dana, Glior. Oh, Shagela, Hunin, Machrai, Shagela, Hunin, Hashim, Bio, Hast. We have a proud history of resistance and we are still singing. Modern, modern time. Yeah. Coming up to the stage now, please keep that applause going as we welcome back Jack Hunter! Oh no. Did you do a Freddie Mercury impression there? <laughs> Dado. Uh, here we are. Lack of oxygen at birth. Some old people say it's a curse. Could things get any worse? You've got to be ballsy, have cerebral palsy. <laughs> Complications, that's for sure. It's always a pain when you're nine weeks premature. <gasps> Gasping for breath in skaboo. It's not something I'd choose. You've got to be ballsy, have cerebral palsy. It's hard to slope through school when the normies call you a fool. It's never been hip to walk with a limp whilst you're forced to wear an ugly splint. A guy never gets asked to dance when he's wearing lycra pants. <laughs> Let's face it, you'll never get to kiss and tell when you spend all of your time in support for learning. Outside, the world is still turning. You've got to be ballsy to have cerebral palsy. As the normies get older, they'll call you an inspiration. Tell that to an employer that'll pay you a fucking wage then. 
The government go on about productivity even though they have no faith in our ability. They're going in for the kill. Cue another austerity drill. Surprise, surprise from a party that constantly spouts lies. You've got to be ballsy to have cerebral palsy. And if you deal with the DWP, you better believe you're going to get an allowance freeze. They think it's okay to do away with DLA. So remember to look your best when you're getting reassessed. You've got to be ballsy and have cerebral palsy. More claimants, less money. These welfare changes aren't funny. So fill out the forms for PIP before you end up in the SHITE. The Tories control our fate. They legislate, intimidate, and discriminate. Just like me, their ideology is slightly off balance. <laughs> but what do you expect when they preach from a manifesto of malice? You've got to be ballsy to have cerebral palsy. Hang on. You've got to be ballsy to vote in these policies because you've got to have the guts to support these cuts when everyone else thinks you're nuts. If you disagree with me, look, look I don't want to be your enemy, but there's no place for compromise when welfare laws are only made through financial eyes. And I don't want to sound like some woke lefty pest, but these policies have literally driven people to their deaths. You've got to be ballsy to have cerebral palsy. And this has been going on for too long, you see. We've all got to be ballsy. We have come to the final poet of the final round. Please go absolutely fucking wild for Jill Just about. Um, I'm going to keep it light with another poem about heartbreak and unworthiness and yearning. Someday... I love Jill Shaw. Be the person I was for you, for her. Search for her in every sunset. Harrow her name on every shore. I write her a love poem. Make her my muse. Make her a place to call home. I'll make her a playlist. Call it her name. Name her chosen. Name her enough. Name her kaleidoscope. Hold her broken pieces to the light at every turn. Marvel at her broken pieces. Dance. Whisper. Jill. The fight for love is always a fight to love yourself first. Love yourself first. I'll call back. Her fingertips take hold of her hand, place a garnet in her palm, and fold her fingers to a fist. Amazing stuff, amazing stuff. Can we just get one big round of applause for all of our slabbers? Amazing stuff, amazing stuff. Uh, while they are talking up the scores, and Perry is pulling out the thing I should have pointed out earlier, the real prize. No, 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 who needs money? Well, you'll see this bad boy. Hey, while he is doing that, hey, I'll, I'll do the poem I didn't do. Uh, I'll give you guys uh, a love poem. Everyone loves a love poem, right? <laughs> Just one person. I don't. <laughs> This is the Low Poet Slam Championship belt. Isn't it beautiful? Yeah. My only upset is I'll never get to hold it. I want to be a mountain. 
so you and I can stand side by side and make valleys together. I want to be the east coast of America, so you can be the west, and when separation puts our love to the test, a nation will build railroads for us. I want to be the sun, so you can be the moon, and when we align, the whole world will look up, but it will be so dark, only we can see what we're doing. I want to be Adam and Eve, before the shame of fig leaves, so we can be the first to experience kiss and touch and love and lust. I want to be Batman. <laughs> so you can be Wonder Woman and we can make fun of Aquaman together, I guess. What I'm trying to say is, I want you. And I want you to want me to. I want to swim in your eyes, not because they're blue, but because they have unexplored depths. And I want to dive to the bottom of you. I want you to be my first sober first kiss. I want you to make up for all the drunken ones I've missed because I honestly can't think of a drink I want to taste more than your lips. I want to be every blade of grass. So when at last the sun begins to rise, I know you'll be holding me like morning dew, I guess. What I'm trying to say is, I want you. And I want you to know I don't say this with ease. I was ready to swear off love for good until you swept in like an ocean breeze and blew my line in the sand back into beach again. And I've wanted to tell you this a million times before, but instead, I write love poems <laughs> and I don't want to have to write them anymore. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very too kind, too kind, too kind. Uh, yes, uh, amazing. Thank you so much for letting me indulge myself in some love poetry. Very nice. Uh, very narcissistic hosting, Kevin. Good job. Uh, it's all in the aid of vamping. I did all my plugs, and now I have nothing to say except gibberish. All my bit of paper. Seamless. Uh, so yeah, what is going to happen is uh, Gally is going to write on that piece of paper the runner-up and the winner. The winner of this heat will receive £200 for winning the heat. They will be the Highland Slam champion and they will be joined with the runner-up and they will go to the EIBF and compete against all the other rubbish regions. <laughs> uh, and to be declared the Loud Poet Slam champion 2023 and the winner, like I said, three grand and they will be the holder of the Loud Poet Slam championship belt. Oh, I'm so excited. Uh, as I said, if the, if the winner and the runner up can stick about for a couple minutes just after we're done, uh, before you go and get hugs from everyone, just to get a couple pictures of you with the belt. So, I mean, that's kind of... Uh, Thanks. So yeah, just stick about for a couple seconds and uh, <laughs> they're like, it's not fucking funny now. Uh, <laughs> I don't care about your bit. Uh, <laughs> guys, you're runner up. Can I get a drum roll, please? Runner up going to the Bookfest final is Lindsay Gilmore! And your winner, and Loud Poets Highlands champion, is Jack Hunter! <laughs> you get to hold the belt aloft, sir. Bask in it. Jack Hunter, everybody! <laughs> No way! Um, I'm genuinely like, just to be in a room with like all you guys, like, Jesus, you know? It's so, so good, so touching, funny, you know? I'll do a final poem, and you're like, fuck, we want to go home, man. <laughs> uh, what are you doing? Okay. Uh, so this is a, I haven't done this one aloud yet. Um, and yeah, it's a silly little ditty. 
Ooh. She likes Queen. Ooh, Grand Canaria. I've never been. But her taste in fashion is a little bit obscene. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on. When did I become so mean? You wouldn't judge a book by its cover. So why are you window shopping for a prospective lover? <laughs> or maybe you would, you virtue signaling prude. Because I'm a single Pringle looking to mingle. I'm not Brad Pitt or an FHM model. I ain't no looker. I'm low self-esteem Donald. God, you're so inclined to rejection. It's made you a crack addled maniac for affection. The slightest detection of womanly invention makes you get it to the point of extension. And by which I mean, you wrongfully invest their friendly interest into a husk of a lead-bellied hope, which seems too improbable for it to bob or, God forbid, float. Chances of romantic entanglement seem somewhat remote. Get back on the love boat, you dejected dope. Because I'm a single Pringle looking to mingle. There's nothing sadder than listening to downbeat Dylan when you're laying a thumping log on the bog. It's love at first shite. Loneliness bites. Forget about blood on the tracks. Those raked skid marks on the pan are getting out of hand. Jesus, that's honking. Put on the extractor fan. Believe it or not, I'm a single Pringle looking to mingle. All right. Nothing better to make your glinting eye gleam than a randy hit of dopamine. Swipe left, right. Oh, shit, I didn't mean a super like. Swipe, left, right. Oh. Deep breath. It's the X. This is a test. <laughs> Next. I'm a single, slightly shaken Pringle. I, I, I don't want to mingle. Who's she liking? What's she thinking? I bet she's as clued in as Alan Sugar on LinkedIn. Oh, I'm done. Forget that. Delete the apps. Wait 45 minutes. Download them back. I'm a single Pringle whose crunchiness is dwindling. <laughs> so you've had a fumble on Bumble, you've made a twat of yourself on Tinder, and you've had a successful winch off a hinge. Watch out. I still remember the changeling that clipped my wings, but I'm responsible for perpetually getting singed. It's a numbers game. I'm a keyboard Casanova that can't be tamed. Fancy a coffee, sugar? <laughs> or a shot of time crisis at the arcade? I'm a single Pringle looking to mingle. Burnout is beckoning, baristas are breaking the bank. Just like Jacinda Ardern, I've got nothing left in the tank. <laughs> God, I really need a long, hard, frank discussion with myself. <laughs> I'm getting pretty annoyed. A squatter living in the void. <sighs> but there's nobody else. Maybe I should just date myself. <laughs> I have never heard anyone say single Pringle with that level of manic intensity before. That was terrifying. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't form, Jack. It doesn't form. Uh, guys, this has been absolutely amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for having us. Can I, can I just get you guys to give a big round of applause to our wonderful judges? Hamish McDonald, Josie Alford, and the wonderful Mark Galley. Stellar work from them. Can we get a huge round of applause for the wonderful staff at the Bike Shed? As Hamish said, please do continue to come and support the poetry going at the Bike Shed. More events like this will happen when more people go to events that already happen. That is the way it works. So please continue to come along and support. Support your local poets. Hold the slammers tonight. Can we get one huge round of applause for all of our slammers? I know, I know for a fact, 
it would mean the world uh, to, to your runner-up and your champion if you gave them your support. I know all the other slammers who are here tonight will be more than happy to, to see these two uh, go ahead to the EIBF Slam final. They are going to be excellent representatives. So please shout them out. Have pride in your champs. Get down to the book fest if you can. Push the, the slam when it comes out. It'll be in the next uh, sort of week or so, right, Gally? Two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks Monday, the slam will go out on YouTube. Share it, let people know, because this has been an incredible event. We have been really happy to, to kind of come and host it. Hey, guys, this has been the Loud Poets Highland Slam. I have been Kevin McLean. You have been fucking awesome. We will see you again next time. Good night! <laughs>Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, we'd appreciate it if you could hit the like button, if you could hit the subscribe button, and make sure to ring that bell icon so you don't miss any updates from us in the future. If you want to go that extra mile and support us a little further, we do have a Patreon channel with loads of exclusive goodies, and you can sign up for as little as a dollar a month. We appreciate your help, guys, and hopefully we'll see you again soon.